The text uh, calls for our attention this Lord's Day is our Old Testament reading from the prophet Amos, chapter 8, and reading today both verse 4 and 7 to begin here. It says, Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What utterly sick people are described in our Old Testament reading for today? We are told that the Old Testament people there hated days like this one, a Sabbath day or any other holy day where the law would not allow them to work in order that they might gather for worship. We are told they hated those days because on those days they could not go out and make more money. But it gets even worse. Not only did they love money, but they took that money from people who had very little. We are told that how they made their money was particularly evil. Their business was done in a way in order that it was all set up to end up stealing the very little money that the poor brought with them to their places of business. They swindled them out of their money until many of those poor had no choice but to enslave themselves to those tyrants simply to survive. Yes, the picture there is that they were just there with a smile on their face, waiting to open their doors on the day of business in order that they could take away from those who came. You see, these customers that they had were not people that had storehouses of food on which to live for weeks, but they lived day to day. They were there gathered at that place of business to buy the necessities they would need for that day. And how were they rewarded? Well, these evil people would indeed sell them the necessities, but they would do so in dishonest ways. They would use false scales to cheat their buyers. They inflated their prices and then shorted the people on what they were supposed to receive. We're told they even sold the chaff of the wheat, which would have been worth nothing in the marketplace, but they sold that to the poor, too, rather than simply offering it to them because they were in need. Yes, these are awful people being described. And who were these awful people? Well, they were the children of God, supposedly. These are the Israelites being talked about, not some foreign nation, some godless nation. Israelites by blood and identity. Yes, they sat there anxious in the temple, because they wanted it to be over, so that they could go and rob and enslave the poor. And yet they wanted to call themselves sons of God. Well, God assured them that such actions were noxious in his nostrils. They stank. God made clear that soon they wouldn't have to worry any longer about selling the fruit of the harvest in dishonest ways to the poor because they wouldn't have any harvest, period. There would be no wheat to sell, because God was about to punish them for their continued stubborn sins. And not only was he going to remove from them the harvest of the fruit of the earth, but he was also about to remove from them for at least a time his very word, because they seemed to have no use for it. Yes, this famine that the prophet Amos talked about would be severe, both physically and spiritually. So what about us today? What of our society? Do we have ways in which we prey upon the poor? Do we have ways that we seek to take what little they have? Are there people just waiting anxiously at the doors of their business in order to take away that little left? You bet there are. And in this way, there's nothing new under the sun. 
Now, I'll admit today that each of the specific things that I'm going to address just for a moment are overall complicated issues to figure out. But what I'll ask you to do is admit that each of these things that we talk about today are things that have been shown systematically and time and time again to truly harm the poorest among us. Let's start with something like day lending operations. If you're not familiar with these organizations, they give out short-term loans, often called payday loans, to those who have run out of money before their next paycheck arrives. They then charge a ridiculous amount of interest on those loans so that by the time that person goes back in order to pay off their loan, a big chunk of their next check, well, it's already been swallowed up in interest. Our society used to have strict laws about things like this called usury laws, but those laws have often been relaxed And particularly, they've been relaxed in the places where the poor live the most. Well, these places claim to provide a service to these folks, all the while stealing from them the very little they have left. Now, of course, we could just dismiss today the whole trouble of that practice and many others by saying that these people that are using these services are the ones who are truly to blame for using them. We can suggest that they're in that position due to their own deeds. And that may be true at times, but we must also remember that at times people are truly using that kind of service to buy necessities for their family. And let's be clear, regardless of why they're using the service, that old mantra, two wrongs don't make a right, certainly applies here. In fact, this problem of giving a loan and charging high interest is something that God felt so strongly about that he forbid it in his Old Testament law. In the early church, the clergy of the church and the lay people, they were told they should not charge anything on a loan, and if they did charge anything, it had to be just the smallest interest possible. To get specific, in the very early church, there were laws that said that if you, chose, you imposed more than 1% on a loan, a rate of 1%, you should be thrown out of the church. That's how seriously they took this. For they saw that to see people in need and to try to profit on them in that very moment was to show that you loved money more than you loved your neighbor in need. Another example in our day of a practice that harms the poor is the whole gamut of gambling and lottery practices in our world. Again, we'll take a different day to talk about all of that in general, but just for today, we must know that gambling operations, whether they're local or now moving online, these things have been shown time and time again to affect the poorest among us the most. Why? Well, they're so easily enticed to want to escape that poverty. The games are operated in a way so that people can engage in them even without having money to engage in them. And the advertising that is used is most often targeted to people in just these specific situations. While there's a lot of people that participate in these activities, the poor are shown always to be the biggest losers ending up further impoverished. Unless we think it's just our society that has problems like this, we should also know that even within the church, there are movements which prey upon the church. Many churches that are shown, especially on late night Christian television, tell people that if they will solely send in exactly this amount or that amount, all their poverty will be gone and all their health problems as well. And so people trust these promises that are nowhere found in that kind of specificity in the Bible. And if sadly, these churches not only are on late night TV, but they're also filling our inner cities, filling people with these false promises. And what do they do? They end up leaving the poor with less money and with more distrust of God and his church. 
Well, there's a lot of other things we could mention, and maybe some of them are on your mind even now. But we must admit that in our world, we still have this problem that those that are doing well often try to exploit the poor in order to make more money. But what does it have to do with us who are here this morning? I mean, Amos was talking about the people of God doing these things directly. But we've more been talking about things that are going on in our society or in parts of the church that we don't associate with regularly. So are we absolved of all wrongdoing quickly? Well, I think here I would suggest for us today we should ask two questions. First, what role could we play in regards to some of these and similar practices? Now, some of us, depending on the role we play in life, the different jobs and occupations we have, we might be able to have some direct influence over these practices. But others might have less direct ties. We can all ask how our own participation in some of these things ends up harming those around us. And secondly, we should ask this. Should we be raising our voices more against such things even if we don't have any other connection to them. Rather than letting these issues become political footballs to throw back and forth between parties, should we, the church, instead take on the causes that God gives us in his word? While we speak on certain issues, do we speak enough about those ways in which the poor are taken advantage of? Well, here is what is clear. All of us need to think through these things a little bit. We need to recognize those times when perhaps we have done things that have harmed our neighbors or have not done things that could have helped our neighbors keep their possessions. And when we recognize those things, we should repent. We must admit that even when we don't see a direct connection to these things in our lives, we do have this general tendency within us as well to love money more than we even love people to make people into objects, to help us get money, rather than to serve them in their need. And finally, Jesus turns it in a whole different direction, in a positive direction, when he tells us that not only are we to help our neighbor keep their possessions, but he says we're to use whatever money we have to make friends in the world, to try to get people to listen to his word in order that all of us together might be received into eternal homes. Yes, we wish to offer people riches, but better riches than even the world can offer. We ultimately want to offer them the very body and blood of Christ that gives to them the forgiveness of sins, won for them on the cross. You see, we care for the poor because God cares for the poor. He cares for the physically poor, and he cares for the spiritually poor. Let us never forget that before God, we are poor. We're the ones who cannot provide even the basic things we need for our life and for our salvation eternally. And yet God doesn't use that as an opportunity to somehow enslave us or rob us. Instead, he gives us his gifts. He fills us up with riches. He frees us. And in so doing, he gives us everything. He gives us everything that we need. I was just going to talk about her soon. (laughs) Yes, Jesus gives us everything we need for our body and soul. In infant baptism, like we saw today, this is where we see this all come together. For Aaliyah there, she brought nothing to this font. She was spiritually poor. We confessed it, that she was born into this world sinful and apart from God. And yet God, what did he do? Well, he gave her everything. He didn't look at her and said, you're poor, you've got nothing, why are you here? Instead, he gave her everything. That's what God does. He sends the poor away full. He does it for Aaliyah. He does it for you and me. And yes, he even does it for the physically poor people in our world. And he wishes for us to join him in doing that work, in making the poor rich. He does it for us. Thanks be to God. Amen.